if you're a business owner, there's going to come a point where you need a stronger tech stack to have a clear picture of everything all in one place. From startup to enterprise, NetSuite is your one-stop solution. Visit netsuite.com slash SPI to download their KPI checklist for free and support this podcast too. If you do find yourself buried in manual work or struggling to have a clear picture of your business, you should know three numbers. 37,000, 25, and one. 37,000, that's the number of businesses which have been upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. 25, NetSuite turns 25 years old this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. And the number one, because your business is one of a kind. So you can get a customized solution for all of your KPIs and one efficient system when, with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need to grow, all in one place. Right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash SPI. That's netsuite.com slash SPI to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash SPI. There was once a time when building a website was a massive undertaking and a huge pain, something that you would need to clear your entire schedule for. Well, guess what? Those days are over, and now you can build a professional, sparkling website in just seconds, thanks to Hostinger. In fact, I recently did this, and I shared the process on my YouTube channel, and it was absolutely mind-blowing, especially considering it took like days on end previously when I first started building websites. This tool is amazing, and I was using AI to do it. So Hostinger is a top highly rated global web hosting and website creation brand, right? And all you have to do to build a website is answer three questions. Here it is. You enter your brand name, you select the website type, you describe your business, and then you can customize it further with a drag and drop editor. It's literally that simple. I just went through this process. I promise you, it is the easiest way to build a website. And it also offers some AI-driven SEO-friendly copy, an AI logo maker. Plus, they make all this super affordable. It's less than $3 a month, including a free domain name. So create a live website now at hostinger.com slash SPI. And listeners of this podcast can enter SPI for 10% off your order and a free domain name. H-O-S-T-I-N-G-E-R dot com slash SPI and use the code SPI for 10% off and a free domain name. It's incredible. Now back to the show. This is a Smart Passive Income Podcast with Pat Flynn, session number 139. And the haters gonna hate, 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 hate. I'm just gonna shake, 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 shake it. Shake it off. I shake it off. Welcome to the Smart Passive Income Podcast, where it's all about working hard now so you can sit back and reap the benefits later. And now your host, who once got in trouble for breakdancing in middle school, Pat Flynn. Want to stop grinding through resumes and just meet your match already? Well, you can with Indeed. If you need to hire, you need Indeed. It's your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, plus their matching engine helps you find quality candidates fast. And it works like really fast. In fact, by the time this ad's over, 23 new hires will have been made on Indeed, according to Indeed data worldwide. It's the perfect match of speed and quality. 93% of employers agree Indeed delivers the highest quality matches compared to other job sites. And I think Indeed is the place to go. It's easy to manage. Everything is in just one spot. The interview process, it's scalable with you and your business as it grows. Like there's no other platform you would need than Indeed. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored ad job credit to get your jobs more visibility at indeed.com slash smart passive. Just go to indeed.com slash smart passive right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Indeed.com slash smart passive. Terms and conditions apply. You need to hire, you need Indeed. We entrepreneurs are at our desks a lot. So having solid equipment is super important. And a sit stand desk can make a huge difference, as many folks on our team will attest to. If you haven't tried one yet, this offer from Uplift is for you. Plus, you can support the show at the same time. Visit upliftdesk.com slash SPI for 5% off your order. Over a million customers have chosen Uplift Desk. Innovative product designs, reasonable pricing, same-day shipping, free accessories with every desk. You can see why they're such a big hit. And did I mention the industry-leading 15-year warranty? And that covers the complete desk, by the way, not just the top or some fine print like that. 
Moving while you work is just healthier. An Uplift Desk provides a state-of-the-art experience. They're stable, made of very solid materials. There's over 100 desktop choices and customizations available. Just the choices for material for your desk are amazing, all the way from laminate to eco to bamboo to solid wood. If you want to build the workstation of your dreams, I highly recommend checking them out. Go to upliftdesk.com slash SPI for 5% off your order. That's U-P-L-I-F-T desk.com slash SPI to get 5% off your entire order. Hey, what's up, everybody? Thank you so much for joining me. This is session 139 of the Smart Passive Income Podcast. And wherever you're at, at this very moment, your car, on a walk, at the gym, maybe you're on a bike ride, doing the dishes, or just chilling around the house, wherever you're at, just thank you. Thank you so much for taking a little bit of time out of your day to uh, spend time with me and our special guest. Her name is Susan Rowan, and she is one of the most amazing people I've recently met. I got connected with her through a friend, actually, somebody else who reads and listens to uh, the Smart Passive Income podcast and blog, and uh, I'm so happy and thankful to have met her, and you'll hear it in her voice. She's just such a kind and loving and generous person, and it's just I couldn't stop talking to her. We actually talked for quite a long time when we first connected, and she was so generous with her time and her tips for me because she is a veteran speaker, she is a best-selling author and a coach, and she was kind of coaching me as I move forward with my speaking career. And I wanted to have her on the show, not just to thank her for what she'd done for me, but to help all of you as well, because her specialty is based off of her best-selling book, How to Work a Room. So a lot of you might remember Jordan Harbinger from Session 121, where we talked about the importance of uh, networking and get putting yourself out there and how to make a great first impression and things like that. And this is sort of like version two, not version two, but sort of level two of that particular episode. So you're going to learn even more skills and more tactics and strategies for how to work a room, meaning how to deliver your best self when going to a conference or whether you're just meeting somebody for coffee or maybe, you know, maybe it's one of the upcoming holiday parties that you're going to, whatever the case may be, using Susan's tips, you're going to be able to better approach people and, you know, make the most out of those in-person encounters. And also we take it beyond that, you know, rooms aren't just in person anymore. There are rooms, quote, rooms online now. There's so many social media platforms and rooms where people are talking and conversing. How do you best approach those rooms? How do you best make a first impression there? We're going to talk about that as well. So I'm not going to hold you any longer. Let's get right into the interview. Again, this is Susan Rowan. You can find her at SusanRowan.com. And also her book is on sale on Amazon. Uh, The second edition, actually, How to Work a Room, Your Essential Guide to Savvy Socializing. So here she is, Susan Rowan. Hey, everybody. What's up? Pat Flynn back here with one of the most amazing people I've recently met, Susan Rowan, who is just an amazing speaker, author, and just a doll. You're going to hear it in her voice. She's amazing. And she's agreed to come on the show to talk about what she's great at, which is how to work a room. And so, Susan, welcome to the Smart Passive Income Podcast. Thank you for joining us today. Oh, it is my pleasure. I'm so excited to be here and with your people. Yes, this is going to be great. And a lot of people who have listened to the show for a while, they might remember episode 121 with Jordan Harbinger. And that was also about networking. Well, we're also going to talk about some of the same things, but there's a lot more, I think, that we could talk about in terms of networking. There's a lot, you know, with the holidays coming up, people are going to be invited to parties and things like that. How do you present yourself best in those situations. And of course, starting the new year, some people are going to make the decision to go to conferences and things like that. How do you reach out to people? How do you talk to people? How do you make the best of all of those potential interactions that you have with people? That's all we're going to talk about today. But before we get to that, Susan, why don't you introduce yourself and talk a little bit about who you are and, and how you got to where you're at? Well, this is like the short version is I was a public school teacher in San Francisco And one year they laid off 1,200 teachers, and I was one of them, Um, and so was my then husband. So people were calling me, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And I'd give them these great ideas, and then all of a sudden it occurred to me, you can't tell people what to do. You have to, as you do through your podcasts, allow people to go through a process so they can come up with their conclusions. Mm -hmm. So I designed a career change workshop for teachers, and because of my PR and political past, got it in a major newspaper. And then all of a sudden, after we were off the nonprofit status, I had 100 people on a waiting list. And I was lucky enough to have a, and get this word, femtor, 
a word made up by Sally Livingston, who said to me, how could I be your mentor? I'm your femtor. And she said to me, and this is why we must mentor and support everyone. She said, Susan, you know what? She said, you have 100 people on a waiting list. She said, my dear girl, you have a business. Who knew? So, you know, the marketplace tells you what they need. And it all evolved over the course of years into um, writing for the San Francisco Examiner, uh, how to work room and networking. It was a career series. Mm -hmm. And then I went to a seminar and a friend picked up one of my columns from the San Francisco Examiner and said in front of a group, Suze, you could really write how to work a room should be a book. Here's the name of my agent. Wow. So that's my long and short story. I, I Networking is different than working a room, but what we want is every one of you listening, we want you to be able to go to any party, convention, meeting, gathering, feel comfortable, confident, have a good time, and be successful. Love it. So the link to how to work a room will be on the show notes, but why don't we talk a little bit about sort of what in, what, what is that book really about? What Can you take us through some of the steps on how to work a room and kind of... For everybody out there who is starting a business, what does that really mean to them? By the way, this is my definition because who knew I was going to start my own business? And someone asked me, well, how do you define how to work a room? And it was many decades ago. Um, that didn't sound right. That made me feel bad I said that. No, it was many decades ago that I looked and I thought, how do you answer this question? And then I kind of channeled my grandfather who had a good sense of humor and said, um, well, working a room is what you do when no one left you an inheritance for the advertising budget. <laughs> you are it. You know, we can do it online. We could do it offline. But when you're starting your own business, part of what you call marketing is visibility. And being able to walk into any room, it's your local chamber, it's a rotary, it's a, a meetup. Whatever it is, it's a charity fundraiser. You're going to the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society charity. You are representing your business and anyone who works with you is as well. Mm -hmm. So I just consider this. Um, in fact, I would be out every night trying to meet people. And one night my then husband said, well, you know, we could have a talk. I go, talk? I've been talking for four nights. <laughs> but it's, it's about being in conversation with people. And this is the thing, Pat. Working room is not only getting to know people. I've got a list. I've got an agenda. Well, first of all, can the agenda, because we can tell you have one. But it's about letting people get to know you. Because that's when they decide they want to do business with you, because people do business with people they know, like, and trust. You need a network. You can't have a network in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. So going out. Now, we were all born in a network. We live in a neighborhood with a network. We went to school with a network, but we need to expand it. And how to work a room is how we do it. Meet new people. It's amazing how one of the most common things I hear from people who are successful is this idea of just getting to know people and creating those opportunities for yourself. Yet, this is something at a young age we aren't really taught. We're just sort of thrown into school and some people make it and some people don't. And so... Now, all of us who are much older now, we're finally starting to realize the importance of networking and getting to know people. But where do we start? How do we understand what, what, what to do? Some of us uh, probably feel a little bit socially awkward or maybe just kind of shy or introverted. I myself am an introvert, and it's taken me a, a long time to finally figure out the benefits of just going out there and putting myself out there without worrying. Uh, but where does one start? Okay, first of all, this is something everyone should know, that according to research, 90% of us, and I've had this in the book for years, self-identify as shy. Important thing to remember, no matter what room you're in, most of the people feel uncomfortable. And we have people who identify as introverts. Um, the po point is, all of these people want to talk to you. <clears throat> Otherwise, they would have stayed home. Mm -hmm. So that's the thing to remember. And unfortunately, a lot of us were not taught this. And Hopefully, schools are now beginning to develop their communication so that they're teaching this. So here's how you start. First of all, the evite or the invitation comes in the mail or on your computer. Look at it. Assess it. Decide. Given your other priorities, because you're running a business, you may have a family. Uh, mom and dad might need you to do something. You never know. 
Um, or you might have tickets to, you know, a basketball game. You never know. Decide if you can go. And when you can, here's the first step. Let people get to know you as being someone who has the right demeanor and behavior. RSVP. Let them know you're coming, whoever them is. And before you go, go online, listen to podcasts, read papers, read print papers, read them online. I don't care if you read them on your wristwatch, Dick Tracy. (laughs) Read the news. You can go to a content curator. You should know what's going on. Why? You'll be more conversant and you'll be more comfortable. Now, right now, San Francisco, we're in the swing of things because we are celebrating the San Francisco Giants being the World Series champions. I wore orange and black for so many weeks that by the time it became Halloween, I didn't even have to change my clothes. (laughs) It was, but you know what? Really, you know, if we think about what's going on in our life and in our business and in our world and prepare our stories, people don't want to hear facts and figures. You've got a story Oh, you won't believe who I met or, oh, I happened to be here and I bumped into or I just can't believe it took me four hours to find, you know, a parking space or whatever. Those are the little things. And I know a lot of people who are shy or introverted think, oh, that's small talk. I can't do it. I am begging our listeners. Let's change our attitude about small talk. Small talk is the biggest talk we can do. You're not going to start with Ebola, famine, war, pestilence. You're going to start with, I can't believe I was so lucky I found a parking space right here. It must be that it's meant to be to be here. By the way, I asked a fellow I knew, what restaurants do you go to? And he said in San Francisco, the ones with parking spaces in front of them. (laughs) So parking and traffic and weather and Just the little things is what connects us. You might find out you have kids in preschool. You might find out your mothers are the same age. You might find out you both like squash, not the eating kind. I mean, the playing kind. (laughs) By the way, I don't like either. So there you go. (laughs) And don't be afraid to add a bit of who you are into what you do. In fact, I'd like you to bring who you are to what you do. Because people connect with who you are. What you do can come later. But if they like who you are and you make them feel comfortable, that's the first step in working a room. How do you balance sharing a bit about yourself and talking about those sorts of things versus being cocky and maybe talking about yourself too much? Well, I here's the thing. You don't talk about yourself too much. A lot of people think that conversation is, oh, I'm going to ask a lot of questions. By the way, I'm originally from Chicago. I'll give you four. You get to the fifth question, Then I wonder, what are you grilling me for? In fact, a section in the book I wrote, grill vegetables, not people. Hmm. You you want to have a balance. So what I recommend is you bring your oar. You can paddle through any conversation. Observe, ask, and reveal. When you meet someone, if you give them an interesting self-introduction, which I recommend, and I want you all to listen, take notes if you can, seven to nine seconds, It's not a 30-second elevator pitch, which, by the way, should be pitched. It's linked to the event, how you introduce yourself at um, a conference that's with IT will be very different than when you've gone to the fundraiser at the local community foundation. So you make your introduction work for whoever's there. And people, why would you do that work? Well, what you want to do is give people who are there a context for knowing who you are and why you're there and what you have in common with them. So it's actually worth the few minutes that it takes to think about it. And I always say, spend five minutes before you go anywhere to prepare your self-introduction. You will feel much more confident. And when you self-introduce, other people will mirror what you do. Then they'll introduce themselves and you're in a conversation because we... We tend to do what people do. We tend to mirror them. So it's seven to nine seconds. It's linked to what you do. And here's the third Roanne tip from my friend Patricia Fripp, who said to me one day, she calls me Roanne, Roanne, tell your people not to give their title, but to give a benefit of what they do. 
oh, wow. So what I don't say to people, I'm a fabulous speaker and great author, all of which are true. What I say to people is, I turn people into mingling mavens. Really? What does that mean? And when they are inquisitive, then you're invited to share a little bit about what you do. And now I want to give the magic tip. You then stop. And this answers your question, Pat. You stop and then you turn to the person and say, how about you? How about you? Yeah. Now, you don't say, what do you do? Because they may do 10 things and they may have a job they hate. But if you say, how about you? You give that person the opportunity to talk about their avocation, Mm. the things they like to do a lot. And then you're off and running. That's really cool. Yeah, I think one of the hardest things to do is just starting that conversation. Yeah. But you often find once you start talking, you, you're, you're good and you're, you're going. Um, and then how would you determine where that conversation is actually headed? And or do you even are you even concerned about that? Because, you know, there's one thing for just meeting people and making friends, but then you know, a lot of people are at these events or networking for a purpose. And so where there's another line to be drawn. Where do you draw the line between just meeting people versus meeting people for a purpose? And then, you know, I, I would also worry of being too obvious that I just want to meet somebody for the sake of, you know, benefiting my own self. I, I think that that is a very legitimate concern. And I wish some of the people who are in the chapter called how not to work a room or don't be a sleaze would actually think about it. Some people who have, they don't have a purpose. They have an agenda and they have a quota and they come off and every single one of us has met someone like this, that you talk to them and you really just want to go, yuck, where are the handy, you know, the hand wipes. Uh, uh, And because they are so intent on their selling themselves, their products, what they do that they forget it's about conversation. When I was writing my conversation book, What Do I Say Next? I interviewed a gentleman who is really good at selling because I walked into his store for one CD and I walked out with five. Nice. So I thought, boy, he's good at what he does. And I asked him, he ended up being the vice president of sales at some company here in Marin. And I said to him, tell me something, Chris, how much a part of sales is conversation? And I quote him, He said to me something that is brilliant. He said, Susan, conversation isn't a part of sales. It's the heart of sales. So if you are a person who's conversant and you listen to what people say and you respond and you know how to segue, which we'll talk about, if you're in conversation, people will listen to what you say. If you're always selling, it's like, Oh, oh my gosh, where can I get the garlic and the, you know, get that vampire away from me? (laughs) But the most important thing is when you're prepared and you feel comfortable that you can have the conversations. It's when you don't feel comfortable. It's tough on people who have sales quotas and they have to make numbers. Mm -hmm. But the idea is you never know who's standing around you. That person who may have the important name tag. Oh, I just pointed to my left. Okay, I was going to say name tag. Here's your tip. Always put your name tag on the right-hand side because it's the line of sight with your handshake. And if someone's met you but can't quite remember you, they could sneak a peek at your name, and you've made it easy for them. Wow. We, oh, we always want to be in a room making it easy for other people to talk to us. Love it. Well, what, really, what do you think? They're going to pick the person that's making it difficult? I don't think so. No, I love that. And that's also where just like I talked about with the episode with Jordan, it was just that smile and that first impression when you come in the room. Those are so important and something that we almost do subconsciously uh, or not do subconsciously. We don't necessarily go into rooms saying, OK, ready? I'm going to smile. I'm going to walk in with my chest up high and my head held high. We don't we don't think about that. Is this something that we, we can practice elsewhere or is this? Yeah, you know what? Practice. First of all, what what Jordan said, who's a pal of mine, I have noticed in almost every program I have done for the last number of years, when I ask people, what did other people do that made it okay to go over to them? Number one, smile. Nobody's going over to the sourpuss who looks like they have bunion problems. It just ain't happening. 
So if you walk in, and I'm going to say this, even if you don't feel smiley, if you will put a smile on your face, people respond to the smile. I'm looking at Pat right now. He's got this big smile on his face, and it's making me smile. And got a little dimple, and you know, I, I'm restraining myself from reaching out to the screen and pinching his yeah, cheeks. You're not talking about the the red in my cheeks now that you've said that. No, I mean, but like, but do you see what I just did? I was like, everyone knows of a great aunt. My grandfather used to do that, pinch the cheeks. But we want to say, when you're smiling, it's inviting. And there are so many people that don't smile. Because we're nervous, because we're shy, because we feel introverted, because we're not prepared, or maybe none of the above, we might just have gotten the news that something happened in our work, in our business, with our kids, with our sister and brother. You never know. So the other piece to it is when you see someone not smiling at an event, don't think they're a snob. Mm -hmm. Give them a chance. I have a little saying that I have. I have a couple of conversation sayings. One is be a two-timer. That means give people a second chance. And definitely don't judge today's book by tomorrow. Wait, let me say it this way. Don't judge tomorrow's book by today's cover. Mm. Because you never know. So be nice to everyone. Be cordial. Be conversant. Have a couple things to prepare to talk about. But here's another point. If you see someone in the room wearing an interesting tie or an interesting pin, they are giving you the gift of gab. What they're saying is, come on over and talk to me. I wore this fabulous necklace. I wore this great tie. I'm wearing this great whatever for you to feel comfortable with me. So when you notice it, go over and say something because they're inviting you. Yeah, you know, it's really interesting. Um, a couple of years ago, I got some good advice in terms of the style that I wear, what clothes I put on at events and things like that. It's just been incredible, the absolute difference that has been made. <laughs> it's it's just people are more friendly to you and, and a lot more people come up to you, like you said. And and I personally just feel more conf- confident in, in those types of clothes because when I go up to people and talk, they're ready and willing to talk back to me, it seems. Well, here's what I did. My brother, a huge Three Stooge fan, um, and he was the um, attorney for the Water Reclamation Department in Chicago. But I saw this tie, and it had Mo Curley and Larry, and it said, Dewey, Cheatham, and, and How, Attorneys at Law. So I bought him this, <laughs> this tie. I asked him once if he ever wore it, and he told me he had to conduct a meeting where he needed the constituents to feel comfortable to come over to him. He didn't wear the fancy tie. He wore the three stooges, or as he said, with the boys around my neck, (laughs) the constituents felt, oh, I could go over to this head attorney. He's got the three stooges hanging. He was inviting people. So whatever you can do to be inviting, your clothing, your smile, put your name tag where it's easy to see, that just makes a difference. And don't forget to stand in like open body language. And if you go to an event with a friend, with a, a partner, whatever. Don't talk to each other face to face. Because when you do that, people will go, well, they're having a private conversation. Mm-hmm. When you go to an event, stand side by side. I love that advice. And I know a lot of people who attend events, including myself, who go with friends and colleagues and business partners. And indeed, when, pe- when two people are facing each other, you don't want to interrupt them. Love that. Now, you, so we're engaging in a conversation with somebody and, you know, we've made that good first impression. We're talking, we're, in, we're into a conversation. And you had mentioned earlier that you have another book called What Do I Say Next? I think this is something, especially when you're meeting somebody for the first time or especially if it's somebody who perhaps you admire, another speaker who you went to see speak, and then you're getting in a conversation and you're just really nervous and you, you, you are trying to listen, but you're also trying to figure out, you know, what's the next thing? that you should talk about and say so you don't embarrass yourself? How do we best understand where to take a conversation? You know, people are very forgiving. And if you go up to someone, I just did this. I heard a speaker that I loved and I waited in line to tell him, oh, thank you. I really learned a lot. You changed my opinion. Um, If you give someone a compliment, believe me, they're not going to shut you up. (laughs) They're going to be very happy to be open to that. (laughs) 
But but what I learned from a friend of mine who's a CEO for an organization, he said, you can't hog people's time. Because if someone's important and you want to meet them, other people do too. So you have to be mindful of watching their signals. So you definitely go over to people. Don't ever not because someone else tells you, oh, don't bother them. Don't do that. Go over to people. Introduce yourself. Be pleasant. Give the compliment. Listen to what they're saying and respond to whatever they've said. I think the problem is a lot of us don't listen to how people respond. We're so busy planning the next thing or playing, you know, Metallica in our head that, or someone else that we're not focused. So people tell you what they want to talk about. On the other hand, you don't want to hog someone's time that other people, whom other people would like to meet. But I'm just going to say this. When you're a nice person that is prepared, has read the paper, knows what's going on in the community, you know something about the event because you went to the website, you did some Googling, you listened to podcasts, you know, you come prepared and you come with some fun stories of things that have happened or odd things like I went to the San Francisco Giants Parade in the rain and I didn't have to leave early. I had to leave uh, two years ago early because I was getting a headache. Because the smell of smoke, all I could say to people was, oh, I think I'm in the glaucoma section, if you know what I mean. So I turned around and made a line for it. But if you bring who you are to what you do, everywhere you go, and let me give you this confidence tip. I do this myself. If I'm walking into a room and I think, holy tamale, I don't know anyone. And by the way, that happens to me. I've gone into rooms where I don't know anyone. I kind of bring my favorite grandparent on my left shoulder, the one who thought I could do anything and do it well. If you need to wear something like from, you know, a grandparent or a parent or whatever, that'll make you feel better. Do that. You you went and listened to the person who told you how to dress. So you feel more confident and always dress for the occasion. That's the other thing in a room. We got the holidays coming up. If it's a black tie only Really show up for that occasion. If it's a business casual, wear that. Don't wear dockers to an event where people are dressed up in suits and ties and maybe even black tie. You're going to be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. You can put that all out by doing some research, looking at the invitation. But getting into conversations is not as difficult as getting out of them, Pat. Yeah, let's talk about that because I know – you might be speaking to somebody and they may be chatterbox, for example, and you're trying to go and meet other people, but they might be tagging along with you and not really, you know, finishing up the conversation. Or perhaps uh, you know that the other person wants to sort of go and, and, and move on, but you don't want to be rude and cutting that conversation off. No, I'm going to switch this 180 degrees. What please, you just please. said is brilliant. When you can tell by someone's body language because you've been observant that they're ready to, they ha, they came there to meet people too. You can't mm-hmm. hug people's time. If you see that and you can sense it, and come on now, we all have a sixth sense. You know, we're, we're, we're pretty astute. What you do is if you notice that and you say to them, it's been great talking to you about, and then give a little summary so they know you were listening, they won't be upset. They'll be grateful because they may not have these gracious exit strategies but you will have let them off the hook by giving them the perfect way out. Right, so keeping track of, this, of the signals, for example, what do those signals look like? Well, well, like it could be someone's tapping their toe or like they're looking or like you could tell that they're just not as easy and comfortable as you would like them to be. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing is you may be ready to move on. So what you do is you um, – You don't interrupt them, Pat. What you do is you interrupt yourself. And here's another thing. That handshake is the, okay, this conversation is ended. Mm. So you can put out your hand and say, hey, it was great to talk to you about. Summarize that. And then what you do, do you have a card? If they don't ask you, you can say, may I offer you one of mine? Now, a lot of people, I live in San Francisco, Silicon Valley. Oh, we don't have cards. Oh, look up my LinkedIn profile. You know what? That's great in some instances. You'll still want to have cards because cards are a very easy way for people that they can look at, see your name again instantly. 
maybe they'll take a picture of it, put it into some app. But having a card is a nice formalized way for them to get all your information, even if they just get it off your card, is they can associate your face with your card. Yeah, that's good to know because I know a lot of people who are attending conferences for the first time. I mean, we're so much in the digital age now. Well, I get a lot of questions. Should I worry about printing a business card? And it sounds like yes, absolutely. I think, you know what? Here's what I say. What could it hurt? I mean, if you don't have a card and someone asks for it, then you're going, no, I don't have one. If someone doesn't ask for it and says, hey, let's, you know, snap our phones together and then, you know, we'll get each other's contact information. But there's something about living with the actual card once you've met someone and you write maybe a little note about them. Mm -hmm. that It's a very tactile way. When, once it's in your phone, it's not as tactile. But right. that could be an age difference. But if someone's asking for a card and your answer is no, that person could be the next best client, the next je job lead. Who knows? Have a card. One thing I am quite proud of in terms of business cards is related to the presentation that I've been doing at different events recently. And in this presentation, I actually do magic. And so to hand out business cards, what I do is I have a deck of cards where on one side it's the face or the number of the card. And on the other side, it's my face saying, thank you, I appreciate, it meeting, uh, I appreciate meeting you. And so what I do is I ask people if they either ask for a card or I'm giving them one, I fan out the cards as if it's a deck of cards with the, with the, the number or the picture face up. And I said, pick a card. And you never see somebody do it that way. But and then they're kind of like, wow, this is different. This is weird. OK. And then they pick they like find their favorite card and they pick it and they look at the back and it's my face with my Twitter handle and website on it saying thank you. And I've got a ton of comments about that. I'm quite proud of uh, of that um, sort of I don't know. It's not I don't want to call it strategy. It's just kind of a fun little thing I like to do, uh, especially for people who saw me on stage and know that there was magic in my uh, presentation, too. That's perfect. It's called, it's making it fit. It's making it memorable. You did magic and then don't we all pick a card? That's what every person who does a magic trick, I have friends who belong to the magic castle. Uh -huh. So up in, in, in LA, it, it find what's comfortable for you. Here's what I would say. And I've written this in the books. Don't, and I've had to do this and it's so embarrassing before you walk into an event, have your cards available to you. Nobody wants to wait for me, and this has happened, to dig through my purse, two pairs of glasses, three different combs, six different lipsticks to find my cards. <laughs> right. I've done that, too. I had them in my backpack. and I, Oh, wait. And then I bend over and pull them out. One, uh, and no, This happens all the time, actually. Um, you get cards during the event and you're giving cards during the event. And then as soon as somebody asks for one, you pull them out of your pocket, but it's your pile of other person's cards. Always happens. Uh, or you hand somebody somebody else's card. I've done that a number of times. So maybe, I don't know if you want to go as far as making sure cards that you receive go into this pocket, cards that you give out go into this pocket. That's been in how to work a room for 25 years. Oh, is it really? Right, right pocket out left pocket in. It just makes more sense. Now, the problem is you guys have pockets at all times. We women don't always have pockets mm, in our suits or skirts and definitely not in our dresses. So we have to be a little bit more creative, but definitely it, it, that's why I like wearing a jacketed outfit because right pocket out, left pocket in. I have given out so many people's cards as you have, but now that we know, and people forgive us because oh, yeah, we yeah. do that and they do it too. And sometimes it's a laugh and sometimes people say, I did that most to my mother-in-law. So, you know, people will help you out. Even if you forget their name, here's mm -hmm. the other thing. Um, I often talk about this because I'm asked about it all the time. You've seen someone in an event six months later, you see them. You're racking your brain. What's their name? I recognize their face. Folks, don't put a hat and a vat and a cat on their head. You're not Dr. Seuss. What you do is you, it, I don't know if Dr. Seuss did that, but I think he did. Um, what you do is you tell people, I, uh, forgive me, it's been one of those days. Can you help me out? I know your face and your name just blanked out. Most people have had it happen to them, so they're going to be happy to tell you their name. Once they say their name, you tell them your name, because believe me, if you forgot their name, they don't remember yours either. 
and then you're in a conversation. Right. I often forget names and I've been working hard at different memorization techniques and there's a lot of tricks and hacks you could do with your brain and some sometimes they work sometimes they don't but one thing that I do and I don't know if this is proper or not so I'm curious to hear your thoughts but often I will be in a group for example and if I don't know somebody's name I'll sort of make an introduction between two other people to catch that one person's name. That's a great idea. Now, here's another thing. I learned this. I think this is even before I wrote How to Work Room. I learned this from a gentleman in a program I did who he was the vice executive vice president of the Harlem Globetrotters, which I kind of figured out he was in the front office because it was like five, four. Um, <laughs> but, but he told me, he said, Susan, what you must do is tell everyone when you go to an event, because he said they go to events all the time. You haven't seen people in six months, 12 months, three months. He said, put out your hand always and say your first and last names. Because that way, once you reintroduce yourself, the person could say, oh, of course I know you. Mm -hmm. Okay, but help me back. But most people will mirror what we do. You say your first and last name, you're shaking hands. They're going to say their first and last name too. Yeah, I love that. There's a lot of different things we could think about, a lot of cool tricks and, and, and things like that, um, especially when you're in a room and you do have that hand to shake and uh, those kinds of business cards to hand out. But what about, I mean, like I was talking about earlier, we live in the digital age and there are rooms that are digital. Facebook, Twitter, yes. there's different areas where people get together online. How do we take these same principles but apply them online in a way that would work for us too? Well, first of all, that's why I rewrote How to Work Room and did the Silver Anniversary Edition. And I said, yeah, the last edition in 2007 had Facebook and LinkedIn, but we have new rooms. And even as we speak, there are people, Silicon Alley, Silicon Valley, creating even more new rooms. First of all, the important thing to note is every room has its own etiquette. Twitter is different than Facebook. Facebook's different than LinkedIn. LinkedIn is a little different than Google+. Plus. You should know the etiquette of that room. It's easy to find out. Google it. You know, watch their little videos where they tell you how to make the most of it. But you do have to remember overall that everything that's about good behavior and good manners face-to-face, I think it's even more important online because we don't have the face-to-face. Yeah. We want to be sure that the tweets we send that we don't get into a dust-up on Twitter We want to make sure that when we're in that room called Facebook, that we're not saying anything that a boss, a client, anyone could come back and say, oh, you wrote that, you know, oh, I got to stay away from this guy. So I think, or or gal, Hmm. um, I think what we want to do is A, know the regulations and the etiquette of that room, B, follow up with people, by the way. The Secrets of Savvy Networking was the book I wrote that was all about follow-up. You worked a room, and if your all those business cards went to the cleaners in your pocket, you're a one-night stand. So really, it's all about follow-up. And the same thing in, you're in the Twitter room. Someone sends a great tweet. I have a dear friend who you, I think, interviewed in, Dory Clark. Dory Clark did a tweet about Daniel Pink's book. Well, Daniel Pink, who's a fantastic author, Mm -hmm. retweeted it. I retweeted it. I know Daniel. Dory sends me a tweet. Thank you for the mention. I looked and saw that she was a writer. We had never even talked on the phone, and we thought we were really good friends. Since then, we've seen each other three times. She introduced me a lot of people. I feel she's one of my dear friends. Twitter is a, and we've done business, and we've, Um, brought each other into each other's networks. If you don't think of those rooms as the potential that real-time rooms, you're making a mistake. But if you don't follow up with people, if you don't participate, if you're not part of the conversation, you miss the point. Right. Now, kind of going back to the in-person meetings and the conferences and things like that, what are the best ways to follow up with that? You know, I know a lot of people, they go to the conferences, they, they come back, with this sort of high of the event and man, I met so many people, such great presentations, such great parties afterwards. And then, you know, three days later it's it's back to normal. Are there, are there any systems or things, you know, important 
uh, things to think about in terms of how do we make the best of a conferences we had, we had just attended? Okay. In the old days, we used to send a handwritten note, but I revised myself in 2000. What you do is you go back. People don't expect a whole, as we would say, Megillah. Send two sentences. I don't care if you send them via email, but you want to make sure before you send the note via LinkedIn or Facebook that these are actual ways that that person responds. Because I have people sending me messages on systems. I go, well, I don't check them. You know, mm-hmm. mail's still a very... It may be old fashioned, but it still works. Within, let's say, three to five days of coming back, send a little note. Really enjoyed meeting you. It was so great to catch up and talk about whatever. This is not the time to sell your product and push anything. Oh, hope we can meet, talk in the future about whatever. Mm-hmm. When you do the email, what someone explained to me is better than the handwritten note is someone can hit reply and say, hey, great meeting you. We ought to talk about. So send the email. If it's a social kind of engagement, I would say that the next thing to do is also, where, especially where you send a thank you for inviting me to speak, is send the email and then follow it up with something that's handwritten that people get in the mail with a very cool stamp because that's memorable. Mm -hmm. And then that gives you another follow-up, sets you apart from the crowd, And it shows that you took the time and they have something that's tactile to hold in their hands. I like that. I like that a lot. I think I, I, I I can use some work in terms of following up with people I meet and I, I get, I meet so many people. I think I'm in a unique position as a, as a speaker and a presenter where, you know, I come home with 300 to 500 cards and, um, you know, I'm just still trying to figure out the best ways to thank everybody and reach out to them. I don't know, even know if it's just worth spending an hour one day and just going through card by card and tweeting and say, hey, it was great to meet you. Hey, it was great to meet you. You know, because they all have their Twitter handles on their cards yes, now. I, know. I, I, I have too. You know what? It, sometimes it's like life takes over where you go, I really don't have the hour. I have other things to do. Mm-hmm. Some people say this is where you get a virtual assistant, but I'm a big believer in having the real message come from you because you want your message to sound like you. Um, but I'm going to tell you something else. That really, if there's someone you really talk to at an event that you see there's some real potential, whether it's work or maybe they could uh, join you as a volunteer on a certain project you're working on, send them the email and then really be different. Take out your phone and actually use it, get this, to make a call. What? I don't even know what that is. I know. (laughs) When I've spoken to a couple of... um, MBA programs, at the end, I'll say to the students, I'd like you all to take out your, your cell phones. And they do. And I go, and when you get home, I'd like you to use it to call your mother. She doesn't want to text. <laughs> <laughs> but when you make a phone call, you set yourself apart from the crowd and people can hear your voice, hear your spirit, hear your tone, and they don't have to imagine anything. And they won't misinterpret. Love that. Thank you, Susan. And before we get on the call here, as we finish up, uh, you know, it's uh, mid-December now. Holiday season's coming up and people are going to be going to parties and stuff. You had mentioned that you had a cool little resource to give away. Um, just We'll just have a link to it in the show notes. But it's about how to t- tell us about this resource and maybe give us a few tips from it. In fact, I'm going to give you two resources. I have a list that I've had for years of the do's and don'ts for a holiday parties Love it. <laughs> to do what to do, what you shouldn't do um, that they're not, it's like one page. It's great, but I'm also going to make sure that everyone has access to the how to work a room infographic. That's a step-by-step process that really summarizes a lot of what we talked about. You could print it off, you know, give it to your friends, your colleagues, your kids. Um, it's a way of how do we make the best of every opportunity, but also how do we make ourselves comfortable and confident? And uh, when I say work the room, for me, that's about socializing, meeting, greeting, schmoozing, connecting. And also, how about this? Having a good time. Yeah. I know a lot of people who go to events who just stress out over it so much. uh, They actually don't have a good time. And I think that's really important. 
So here's, I, I am going to say this to all our listeners. Every time you walk in a room, I'm going to be on your left shoulder whispering in your ear. Go over to that person standing alone. They'll be happy to talk to you. There is that group having a good time. I bet they're going to be glad when you join in. And just remember, everyone's there for the same reason. And a gentleman who once uh, called into an NPR radio show gave me a phrase that I'm going to give you all. He said to me that when they went to dances in their community, they always said the roof is the introduction. If you're under the same roof, you have something in common. Mm, I love that. Thank you so much, Susan, for joining us today. Uh, we will have links in the show notes for those resources. And you can also visit Susan at Susan Rowan, R-O-A-N-E dot com. Susan, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. All right. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Susan Rowan. Man, just such an amazing person. And I'm so thankful to have met her. And I'm so thankful to have featured here on the show for you. You can find her on her site at Susan Rowan. That's R-O-A-N-E dot com. You can also find her book. I'll have all the links and resources, everything we mentioned on the show notes, which you can find at smartpassiveincome.com slash session 139. And that includes those free resources that she's going to give us as well, that infographic and also the sort of holiday tips guide, which is super cool and very appropriate for this time of year. So also, I want to take a quick moment just to thank you. I don't know if you realize this, but you've had, you, the listeners, have made a massive impact on the direction of where Smart Passive Income has gone. Uh, as a result of you, I've been interviewing certain guests that you've recommended. As a result of uh, your recommendations, I've been tackling different topics that are, that are of high interest to you. Uh, in addition to that, I created a brand new podcast called Ask Pat, which you may have heard of before. And on that show, I answer voicemail questions from you as well. You can actually check that out at askpat.com. But that wouldn't happen if it wasn't for you. Obviously, Ask Pat, there needs to be questions in addition to my answers in order to make that show a success, and, and I'm so thankful that uh, it's there, and, and I have you to thank for that. I also have you to thank for pushing me to create some online courses to help you through a number of the, of the different problems and pains that you might be having with your online business, uh, the, the scaling of it, just even the start and the process of it. Um, even though there's a lot of great free information here via the podcast, I know, and I know this from my own experience as well, courses can be life-changing because you you purchase a course and you are just in that mindset of actually doing that thing that that course tells you to, to do. And I have a number of different courses available to you if that's the kind of thing you need in order to actually finally start getting results and taking action. So I know a number of you have already taken action, which is fine. Like I'm not trying to push these courses on you, but they are there and available for those of you who would much prefer to get that targeted information and the accountability and the handholding through those processes. So if you want to check out and see all the courses that are available to you, all you have to do is go to smartpassiveincome.com slash courses. That's a page that's going to continually grow over time as well. So keep checking back, smartpassiveincome.com slash courses. I look forward to, uh, to hopefully seeing you there. Thank you again for taking time out of your day to hang out with me. I hope you enjoyed it. And I can't wait till we can hang out again in the next episode. Until then, keep pushing forward and keep practicing your skills, your conversation skills, and just getting comfortable being around people. I still need work and I'm continuing to take advantage of those situations that I purposefully put myself in because I know it's going to help me moving forward and I know it's going to help you too. Cheers, take care, and I'll see you in the next episode of the Smart Passive Income Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Smart Passive Income Podcast at www.smartpassiveincome.com. Hey there, and thanks for sticking around to the end. If you're looking for more great shows like this one, definitely give How Success Happens a listen, another great show from the Entrepreneur Podcast Network. On How Success Happens, Robert Tuckman features some of today's brightest entrepreneurial minds talking about overcoming challenges and viewing them as learning experiences to create success. The challenges that entrepreneurs face are ultimately what make many of us successful, however we define success, and that's what the show is all about. There's lots of names you'll surely recognize on the show every single week. Just recently, Robert had Nasty Gal CEO Sophia Amoruso on the show and the former CEO of Snapple the week before that, which is really awesome. So listen to How Success Happens right now on Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, or Stitcher.